forever. But um, I'm happy to try to answer questions. I apologize if I use jargon. I've really tried to go through this, but occasionally I'll say some perfume or other term. I'll try to tell you what it is. If you don't know, put it on the chat thing and um, possibly Mineta or Saskia could answer it if it's a perfume thing. Um, but we will get to you. So, um, all right, so let's go. So <laughs> in as part of our digital thing, we are really trying to smell along with the classes. Like it's really cool, you guys have a class coming up and Perfumer's Apprentice is sending out supplies, right? So um, from what I understand, you can do a class and then you can you know, uh, go along with them. I just got an email from, uh, I'm, I'm in the wine country, I just got an email from a winery and now they're doing um, Zoom wine tasting. So they basically send you the wine and then they have like a Zoom uh, wine tasting online, which I think is cool. So um, let's get into this. So let's start. I sent you guys a link. I don't know if you saw it. It's for um, a little video that's on YouTube, and it's from a blog called Bois de Jasmin um, from Victoria, who's a perfumer, and she just happens to put up, after I decided to do this talk by coincidence she put up a thing about smelling lemons it's so much better than anything I could do so I'm a little intimidated but you might want to look at that but she basically talks about um, how you know if you practice smelling and paying attention and taking notes it, it really helps you in translating things I'll be talking about that a little bit today um, but I wanted to sort of smell along. I'm going to show you a cologne or two before we start in on the session, just because it's kind of relates to what we're talking about. So um, with citrus fruits, they generally get the oil through what's called expression. They like press it out of it. Um, there are a few fruits that they distill, like limes, and occasionally they do like a molecular distillation, but most stuff is still pressed out. And in fact, it's just pretty much like when you have a cocktail and you squeeze the little piece of citrus rind and you see the oil, that's it. But today I have my giant microplaner here and um, this is very cool. If you guys are um, do-it-yourself people and you're macerating stuff, I use this thing to macerate stuff and put it in alcohol like I make my own ambergris tincture and stuff like that. But it's really good for citrus. So go ahead and either, you know, get a little grinder or something, and I'm just gonna like grind it here for a second. Um, and then, so we're gonna take these short little staccato sniffs, like little bunny sniffs of this. And we'll be talking a little bit about the citrus smell it's what's called the top note because it's very fugitive. It just flies off and it doesn't last very long. Um, there are a lot of components to it. I'm going to talk about a couple things today. I don't want to go too much into chemistry to torture you, but we will be talking about it um, because several different aroma compounds that do make up the smell of lemons and um, they're kind of cogent to some of the herbs I'm going to be talking about today. So before we go in, um, just a couple cologne things I'm gonna be talking about. Um, unfortunately, the lighting here is a little weird, but let me try. Okay, this is the world's tiniest bottle of 4711 cologne. Oops, sorry. Um, we're gonna be talking about this today because it is a citrusy cologne, a classic cologne, um, which is used by spiritual practitioners. I know that in Puerto Rico, spiritist mediums, espiritismo, um, mediums use it quite a bit in their practices. We'll be talking about that, 4711. Um, and this is another cologne um, from the 1800s, which is easy, ooh, sorry, Hoyt's Cologne. Hoyt's Cologne. Um, this was made in the 1800s, um, and it has been adopted as a lucky cologne. It's very lucky for gambling. Um, I don't know if you can see this. I have roots in there. I'll be talking about it. A lot of times people would add stuff to clones to make them more powerful and lucky. This is a very Southern, like lucky kind of thing. We'll be mentioning this. Um, and 
we'll be starting off um, sort of historically with one of the older citruses, which is citron. But uh, in French perfumery, they always like to use the French name, which can be confusing. So the French name for the citron fruit is C-E-D-R-A-T, cedra, which looks like seed rat. Um, <laughs> and this, which you might be able to see if you're lucky, um, this is a bottle, this is an uh, Guerlain, a Guerlain cologne, and it's an eau de cologne that's called uh, Eau de Fleur de Cetra. This came out in 1920, so it's like the 100th anniversary. This is this incredible cologne that has an intense lemony flavor uh, and aroma. It's really, really nice. It's kind of like a candy lemon. We'll be talking about it today and um, other things that are very lemony. So. I just want to start with this and uh, just as a traditional thing in the olden days, a lot of times people didn't put cologne on their skin. They put it on like a scarf or on a fabric. And so I've got my like little, my COVID mask here that I'm just going <laughs> to squirt it with a little bit so, <laughs> so that I have it here. So I'm ready to screen share. We should probably dive in. Are you ready, Saskia? Hello. Saskia? There we go. Sorry, All right. I'm on mute. Yes, we're ready. Okay. So, um, hold on. I'm going to just move my position. Um, I'm hoping you might be able to hear me better because I was in a weird kind of hole back there. Is, is my voice okay? Yeah. Yes, okay. definitely. So, so, erase my head and put my little um, avatar in if you can. Can you do that or just get rid of it? Done. Okay. Um, so let me just start here. Um, I'm just sort of diving right in right now um, with this as an, a, an example. So this is an Italian charm against the evil eye. It's a lemon with three big stakes, uh, spikes through it. Um, and I will be talking a little bit about the history of citrus in Italy. It's kind of a big deal. Um, they, this is still a charm that is used um, uh, it's still a traditional folkloric charm. It's been updated. A lot of times they'll use nails, for instance, or they may use little um, push pins and put it in there with some red thread, but it's considered to be very lucky and that people will put it in their house. Um, the reason I'm bringing this one up is because there is this whole folklore of lemons as antidotes for poisons. And so traditionally, the evil eye, which is malocchio, is thought to be this poison that exudes from people's eyes that they actually um, can transmit to you and cause bad things to happen. Sometimes they do it on purpose. Sometimes it's just through envy that it kind of just happens automatically. But this is a theme <laughs> that lemons are very protective against poisons, including the evil eye, which will be coming up. So I wanted to just start with this. And Italy we'll be talking about for sure. We'll definitely talking about Israel. I'm glad someone's here from Israel too. So, um, we have two people next. from Israel actually, and I think it's about oh, five a.m. for them. So yeah. Thank you. Okay, are we ready for the next? Okay, so this is sort of a. I'm going to give you a quickie introduction. This is like a really crazy Mr. Toad's wild ride kind of thing because I'm going to be talking about Italy, Israel, there'll be Babylon, we'll be in Tibet, we'll be in New Orleans, we'll be all over the world talking about things that are lemony. Um, but there are some things that are, that are found in common and that is that um, we're talking about things that are like primarily oral traditions that are passed on through folklore. Some of these get codified and appear you know, in written works. Um, I personally have learned a lot of this because I've studied with people and they've taught it to me. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that because a lot of times people have slightly different views depending on where they're from. Um, but, and um, otherwise, I've learned a lot of this from some very, very obscure academic stuff that's really hard to find and that is inaccessible to a lot of people. I will try to tell you like where it comes from, but there's some really obscure medical history stuff and, and anthropology things that people don't normally have access to, which has a lot of perfume stuff. So I always start with this too. There's no reason to believe any, anything, you know, about magic is like literally real, but it's very helpful 
if you adopt a kind of a, uh, as a trial, just this worldview of someone living a long time ago, where the world was a magical place. It was filled with spirits. Um, and, uh, and in an animistic worldview, things that we think of as, as inanimate, like plants and objects, are alive and they have agency. I mean, they sometimes have their own destinies. So I'll be talking about this. There's this whole thought that some sorts of plants and stuff almost are like driving people around like they're the boss. It's kind of interesting. Um, my particular interest or one of my interests is, the, is this. I love perfumes as something pleasurable. I mean, this is what they call the sort of hedonistic aspect. Um, but obviously we're here with the Institute for Art and Olfaction, and I think people understand that besides just being um, something that's pleasant, that perfumes can also be um, a modality for art, and they can be something that people are fascinated with just as far as their stories and how you can use them. The other thing that I'm really into besides that is that uh, perfumes are also medicines. They have been used as remedies, not just like aromatherapy helps you sleep kind of remedy, but actually more like a magical remedy where if people have certain issues in their life that the perfumes could help them. I mean, if you needed a new job because you're in a dead end job, someone might do some sort of ritual work with a perfume. So in fact, this is this almost like a uh, orthogonal to the world of fragrance. It's not necessarily separated from it, but it's like an extra action that fragrances actually can fix things and are, are kind of like, you know, medicines. So, okay. So next. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about um, the word materia magica is really kind of an um, archaeological term but it's somewhat stolen from another term, which is materia medica, M-E-D-I-C-A. Materia medica is usually what's referred to as lists of stuff that are, have a pharmacological use. In the olden days, these were mostly herbs, but sometimes also minerals and you know, other types of early chemicals and stuff like that. Um, materia magica are material objects um, which are used in ritual practices and in spiritual practices. In this case, I'm going to be talking about fragrant materials that are used. Um, I will reference this. They generally are used in the context of a performance in, in that the person is actually performing something which could involve prayers. It could involve a lot of visual stuff like what they're wearing or actual movements and things like that. So it's generally not just the fragrance is the fragrance used with the ritual, which I'll talk about. Um, so, um, and then I also, this is just to make reference to this, there's a lot of lore about where did people learn about perfumes and cultures have different traditions. Interestingly, a lot of cultures have traditions that spirits taught humans about plants. In the West, we have this apocryphal book of Enoch, which is not part of the traditional Bible unless, well, for, there's a few Orthodox faith, uh, 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 branches and so on that do use the book of Enoch. Um, this is an interesting book of the Bible that was sort of uh, excerpted, which talks about the fallen angels. And in it, the fallen angels come down and they teach uh, humans technology. They specifically mention that they teach them about cosmetics, metallurgy, and stuff like that. And, and also a lot about plants and sorcery. Um, this is developed later by this early Greek historian, Zosimus, who specifically says that they taught humans the arts of distillation and alchemy. So, um, you know, this, this follows into some folklore that these spirits actually taught people about how to make perfumes and fragrances. So, um, you know, this will kind of come up, but according to your interpretation, then perfumes are either angelic or perhaps demonic. So um, next slide. Okay, so how do people decide, you know, what fragrances mean or what plants mean or what they're good for? So one of the things that is sort of important in Western um, traditions is something called the Doctrine of Signatures. Now, this was described in ancient Greece. Um, there's a famous herbal by um, Dioscorides. Um, it became very popular, like later, this very famous physician, Paracelsus, in the 15th century and later, who talked about it. And then the church 
did not totally poo-poo it. They had this idea that God had created plants and he left kind of visual clues about what they're for. So your right is a chamomile. I'm, I don't know if people have had chamomile tea, um, but chamomile has these really beautiful little tiny flowers. They're yellow in the middle, and then they have the little white petals. And if you look below, you can see an eye. So if you use your imagination, the center looks like an eyeball, and the things around it look like eyelashes. So surprise, surprise, chamomile ha was thought to be helpful for your eyes. It was used as a medicine for people's eyes. Um, uh, pertinent to us, if you look in the middle, there's something round and yellow. So what are you holding? I see Saskia holding something round and yellow. And I want people to sort of just think, what's a super obvious thing if you look up to the sky? The sun is round and yellow. So the sun gets linked with a lot of these herbs that have that round and yellow. And the sun also gets linked, linked with uh, oranges and lemons because they're thought to be almost like a signature of the sun. Um, so, uh, Besides the visual stuff, also smell and other things are, reflect the virtues of it. Um, I won't go into this too much, but non-Western traditions really do this much better. Like for instance, in West Africa, in Yoruban traditions, they have this super elaborate thing where they go with the texture of the leaf. Is it raspy? Is it smooth? Is it juicy? And so on. And then they classify it according to different kind of deities that it's associated with. What's important also is when people name plants, they're classifying them just by the name, and this will come up a little bit later. Um, the name of it will give you a key about what it's for. Okay, so next. Okay, I apologize, this is fuzzy. I don't know why it didn't come out very good, but it's just the way it is, don't try to fix it. So, <laughs> um, we, if you take any fragrance classes, you'll learn that there are all these schemas for classifying perfumes. Some of them are mind boggling and hard to comprehend. A lot of them are based on marketing, like how you like sell something. There's ones based, a lot of them based on, um, on music. That's why we talk about accords and things like that that are musical. A lot of people like um, Mandy's wheel. I really like it because it has parallels with wine tasting and beer tasting wheels. And I think people intuitively get it. If you look towards the red part to the left, my last talk was on spicy stuff. So I flipped to the other side of the wheel today to talk about citrus. Um, and what's interesting is that not only is the fragrance family, the citrus fragrance family, something that we use to classify stuff by smell, but as I will be explaining, there seems to be this um, very common motif that things that smell alike have very, very similar like magical virtues. I will be talking about lemons, but this goes with other stuff. I'll mention it in passing. Like for instance, think the rose is notorious as the love thing. Um, things that smell like rose, like rose geranium and palmarosa are surprise, not surprisingly also like used for love things because they're kind of in the rose family. Okay, next. Okay. So I want you to look at this. This is obviously an ad for orange juice, but um, what it tells us is that there are all these sorts of cultural associations with citrus fruit. Just the color of this, it has all these golds and reds and it has like the ship and notice it has the sunset, which is interesting. A lot of this refers to this whole myth of this magical place in the far west that was on the edge of the world, which was the Hesperides that's mentioned in mythology. That's where the golden apples were. Um, and um, this is replayed quite a bit because at a certain point, like in the Renaissance, when citrus was more familiar, people started deciding that the golden apples were probably citrus fruits. Um, and so they absorbed a lot of this mythos. So they were associated with this magical place where there's always sunshine, it's always spring, it's golden, their golden age, there's this whole idea of youth. So not surprisingly, they use this in advertising, but in fact, in magical traditions, the fruit is actually thought to have similar benefits too. Um, I mentioned terroir, like where something grows is important. An herb that is like, say like a violet that grows in some place very shady um, and cold, cool and dark has very different kind of magical use than something that grows in the 
desert, like say frankincense and the hot sun. So um, in this case, these are things associated with the sun, as you can see in this ad. Okay, next. Okay, I will also be talking about how lemon is associated with cleanliness and freshness. Um, I will be talking about what we call functional products. This is in fragrance, they have this whole thing that there's fine fragrance and then there's things that are functional that are like soaps and cleansing agents that I think it's sort of an arbitrary honest because a lot of functional things smell fantastic and it's sort of this kind of interesting divide between a commonplace thing and, and something that's fine fragrance. But what most of us probably do have either lemon or orange scented things that are used for cleansing. Um, and uh, one, of the, one of the interesting things is that, I will show you in the next slide, is that um, lemon actually contains, lemons and oranges contain something that is literally a solvent, which is really interesting. And even 2,000 years ago um, in, in uh, Rome, people used things like lemon balm for cleansing. In the Middle Ages, they used it as a strewing herb. If you're not familiar with that, um, people used to tear up herbs and throw them on the floor so that when you stop, you were walking on them, a you know, beautiful fragrance would happen. So this is like an early form of environmental fragrancing <laughs> would be strewing herbs. And um, lemon balm was frequently used for that. So we're basically repeating something that's been done for a very long time. Um, okay, next. Okay, so again, this is a little not so great. So D-limonene, and I'm not gonna give you guys a ton of chemistry, but I will give you a, lit, a little. So lemons and oranges, in this case lemons, they do have a lot of different um, aroma chemicals which make up their fragrance. They have a lot, but there are usually a few of them that, that are, are the big hitters that give the major impact of the fragrance. So lemons and oranges and a lot of other citrus have limonene in it. Um, this is a terpene that has a very bright lemony fragrance. What's interesting is that it's this incredible solvent, and I think people are familiar, like if you know people who work in auto shops and stuff around Greece, a lot of times they have like an orange or a lemon cleanser that cuts through grease. It is literally something that will cut through like even um, heavy adhesives if stuff is stuck onto surfaces. And this is really interesting because a lot of times when people observe the physical action of a plant, like if it stops bleeding or it does something else, in this case, if it's a solvent, they translate that into like sort of a spiritual or healing um, type of function. In this case, it, rem it removes stuff that's gucky, like spiritual grease. It also helps people who feel like they're literally stuck or contaminated. And I said that it includes clearing away of people. It, lemons are used sometimes for people who feel like they're stuck in some sort of obsessive relationship and they have to clear it, you know, they will do, often do these rituals where they use the, like candles and lemons to kind of like get rid of the ex-obsessive boyfriend who's a stalker kind of thing. Um, but it's because it's literally a solvent and it gets rid of like, you know, grease and greasy people. Okay, next. Can you guys hear me okay? Am I okay? Not? Okay. Okay, so I mentioned the cologne, the cedra, which is citron. So before I talk about lemon per se, I need to talk about the parent of lemon. So it is generally um, assumed, or as far as I can tell, that lemon is a hybrid of citron and of bitter orange. Uh, the whole thing about citrus fruits is like dizzyingly complex. There's like the hybridized, there's like a million varieties and so on, but based on some of the latest DNA stuff, they're pretty sure that the lemon came as a hybrid of um, citron and bitter orange. Now, um, so citron is one of these kind of ur fruits. It's like one of these primordial kind of citruses which um, they feel originated in the foothills of the Himalayas. Um, it comes in a lot of forms. Probably most of us, like I know people from California, notice that one at the bottom that looks like a little monster or has little fingers, and that is a Buddhist hand. Um, the, the preferred ones sometimes look like little fists. Um, 
So the Buddha's hand is, is something that people will have in Lunar New Year in, um, you know, the Institute is located in Chinatown. And so if we were in Chinatown, you'd be able to find it because it is incredibly lucky for New Year's. A lot of times people will put it on their home altar. Um, it represents good fortune or they give it as a gift. Um, so this is a familiar form of it, but some of the other forms you can see up there um, are also citrons. Um, they have, for a long time, they're associated with long life and wealth. As I mentioned, the whole uh, lemon citron thing, they're antidotes to poisons. Literally in ancient Rome, where people were poisoning each other all the time, it was thought that like there was some magical ability to like ward it off if you had a lemon. Um, so these are also shown in some um, depictions in ancient Egypt. There, it's a very pretty much impossible to figure out if they're showing citrons or lemons. It's unclear when the lemons actually appeared, but they probably are either citrons or lemons. And there's frescoes in Pompeii, which show what looks to be um, citron. I'm not going to go into too much crazy detail, but there are um, ways in which um, they can kind of try to determine this. Uh, when we had the Egypt talk, she talked about um, uh, archaeobotany or paleobotany where they look at um, plant remains or they look at like pollens and stuff and they can tell you what it was but they can make a guess but anyway so citrons have been found throughout all these cultures but they believe they came from the Himalayas which leads us into our next slide Boop. okay so now we're in Tibet so um Okay, I find it really challenging to explain entire spiritual traditions in 30 seconds, but I will attempt to do so. So, <laughs> so um, Buddhism. So there's like probably 500 million people in the world who practice some form of Buddhism. There's so many different schools. There are certainly the very ascetic, you know, Buddhists who live very simply out in the forest, meditating all day. Um, Vajrayana Buddhism is one branch of Buddhism. Most people are familiar with it because it is a, a branch that's practiced in Tibet. It would be considered like a high church form of Buddhism that uses a lot of stuff, like you know, very elaborate altars, very elaborate temples. Um, um, the offerings are very elaborate. Um, and what's interesting about Tibetan Buddhism is that um, it it absorbs or has absorbed a lot of earlier spiritual and religious practices and they sort of like bring it all into their Buddhist tradition and, you know, bring them into the Buddha family. So in this case, this is a wealth deity. Some people call him a money Buddha. In India, um, his name was Kubera. Um, in, in, in Tibet, it's Shambhala. It's sometimes transliterated as Zambala. Um, and it has the same root as the word for citron, which is usually jambera. So it's almost like a play on words like citron is jambera and the wealth god is jambala. And what is that thing he has in his right hand? That is a citron fruit. So in, um, in Tibetan iconography, if you have a Buddha or deity holding something, it's very important. It means they have that power. The right hand grants boons, like it gives you gifts. And so he is literally giving you the citrus fruit. The citron is a manifestation of his wealth. So clearly the citron is, you know, a wealth giving kind of a fragrance and plant. Um, he is, not to get too much into detail, but in Tibetan Vajrayana Buddhism, they have these five Buddha families that are um, classified by color. So the gold or yellow family is called Ratna, which means jewel and jewel and in, in it or enrichment. And so the whole family is a is associated with wealth. And this happens to be one of the more um, popular of the deities, not only wealth, but I have heard also traditionally a long time ago, women would also go to Jambala for fertility because the fruit has a lot of seeds in it. So it is associated kind of with just a genuine, you know, all kinds of good fortune, but mostly money. Um, Saskia was, I, I withheld the mantra last time. So I'm giving you the mantra here. If you want to like chant mantras and bring citron fruit. Hang to on, is this off. a fertility it's, mantra? Cause I don't, I don't need that. <laughs> no, no, it's for money. 
I would say ninety nine percent of people. Probably, yeah. All right, yeah, thank you. Jambala is very popular. Probably ninety nine percent of people are into Jambala is for money. So you could do the whole Om um, Jambala Jalandraya Soha kind of mantra there. So all right. <laughs> um, okay. So next. Okay. Now, thank God, there are people from Israel. Please help me if I embarrass myself. But um, what we have here is, is a citron that's used in the Feast of Tabernacles, which is a fall feast. Um, and um, the, it's, the name for it is etrog. Um, and it's, it's considered to be, the quality of it is hadar. So uh, I, this is so embarrassing because there's people from Israel. They'll help me, I'm sure. But um, this is used, you hold it in your hand as part of the ritual. It's part of one of the sacred plants. Um, the word Hadar means beautiful or majestic. And at some point, this fruit was adopted as the sacred fruit to be used. No one really knows why. There's a lot of studies that show that it was because of uh, Babylon, some sort of exile where there was some place where these fruits were available. Um, but later, there's archaeological evidence of them growing um, in Israel where they still grow. Um, so they must have started cultivating them some time. Also, it, it was thought to represent the heart, like the physical heart. And if you look at the fruit and you think about, not that most of us slaughter animals, but what does an animal heart look like? It is approximately the size and shape. It kind of looks like a citron. It's obviously not that color. Um, but the fruit, you know, symbolized this majesty, beauty. It symbolized the heart. Um, and I'm not going to go into this, but it's still cultivated to this day. It ha there's like extremely strict rules about how it's grown. It has to be flawless. It's kept in these special boxes because you can't have a piece of fruit that's like not perfect. Um, and um, it's fascinating because it's something that's been maintained for such a long time. And these really flawless fruits are extremely expensive. The ones that are not that great can be used for fragrance and other reasons. Um, for you know they candy them and stuff like that but for um the feast of tabernacles it has to be perfect so um so there's another interesting thing um but the heart thing is important we'll keep that in mind because that will come up okay next okay so i'm not in interest of time we're going to get into a lot of practical stuff and i don't want to go into some crazy history thing because it's not totally the point of this but um, citrons and lemons were basically for rich people for a very long time. They're very difficult to grow. And um, they were mostly in special gardens for very elite people. They were cultivated, as I mentioned, um, that you could see that they were cultivated in, in uh, Israel. They were very popular in Persia, all through the Islamic empire. Then what happened, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit, is that... Um, when um, Sicily fell under Islamic rule, like around the ninth century, and then later Southern Italy was also um, pretty much uh, taken over by um, Muslim conquerors, they brought this really advanced um, culture, the citric culture, and also was brought to the Iberian Peninsula, to Spain and Portugal. So fruits started to become more available. This is 1620. This is a uh, still life, and there's lots of really fascinating things about still lives, but this would probably be a manifestation of the person's wealth to show like, I am so rich, I have a giant, it's like, look at my bling, I have an entire thing filled with like um, tigers and caviar and diamonds. This is kind of like, look how much citrus I have, because this would be worth a lot. If you live in LA, this is like what falls into your alley and people don't even pay attention, which is sad. So, <laughs> okay, so next. All right, okay, so you can't really read that at the top. I have this little thing ignored in Eurocentric history. So I grew up in California and I went to college here. I mean, I think I had a decent education, but I can tell you now, most people who grew up in the United States and Europe have an incredibly Eurocentric um, education. Most of us are not particularly familiar about a lot of Islamic history. It's super important in the history of perfume. It's incredibly important in talking about citrus fruits. So I am going to bring it up. 
Um, there, during the Middle Ages, um, when we kind of, so most of us have this history thing that's like this. Oh, there was, okay, there's Egypt and Greece and Rome, and then Rome fell, and then there were like medieval knights and everything was quaint, and then there was the Renaissance. But it, <laughs> it wasn't like that because there was an Islamic golden age from the 8th to the 14th century. Um, this uh, shows Baghdad. There was this incredible center called the House of Wisdom um, that was almost like the Library of Alexandria. And what happened, it was very cosmopolitan. Um, the caliphs invited scholars from everywhere, including Jewish scholars, Christian scholars, um, to come and translate things. So in fact, they translated a lot of texts from ancient Greece um, and ancient Roman texts on plants, on the sciences. Um, and this became really the center of learning for technology. Um, and what's important for us is that they wrote a lot of treatises on fragrant materials. And in fact, as I will explain, the doctors wrote things on what they call aromatic medicines, where they felt that certain perfumes were really um, powerful ways of healing people. And this later kind of led to people starting um, medicines involving fragrant materials and clones and stuff like that. So I mentioned here in the on the right. So the very famous Caliph Harun al-Rashid is, is known from the Arabian Nights because he's sort of mythologized, but he had this fabulous, you know, Baghdad palace with all these gardens. He's known for bringing gifts to Charlemagne. This was like this really important thing. Um, and he brought these enormous um, uh, bottles of perfume or containers of perfume along with like precious ivories and clocks and stuff like that. But this is really fascinating because it really shows they were incredibly advanced in fragrances during the Middle Ages. And um, later, this became kind of an important thing. So, all right, next. Okay. On the right, that thing is an apothecary bottle. So, an apothecary is kind of like a pharmacy. It's where people would go to get all kinds of medicines. But... It was like a place filled with all kinds of incredible fragrant spices with like uh, incense resins, all kinds of things like that. You can see that the gentleman there has a turban. It probably represented some very famous Islamic uh, physician or some sort of um, important person like that. This, I don't know. I forgot to write down where this is from. It may be Spain. I'm not sure. Um, but as I had mentioned, this was a golden age of translation. Um, which really led to a lot of things um, in other nearby countries, and I'll briefly mention this. So one of the first medical schools was in Salerno, which is in Southern Italy. Um, it, there's this like sort of thing that sounds like a bar joke, where basically the, the story is, is that a Jew, a Muslim, and a Christian met in Salerno where the, while they're there, and they're like so knowledgeable about plants, they said, hey, let's start a medical school. And it was very cosmopolitan and they translated a lot of stuff. And that was one of the first medical schools which passed on a lot of plant knowledge um, to monasteries, as I'll talk to you about in a minute. And then the south of France, the 12th century, there's Montpellier. This was important because this was also a place where spice traders were and they just knew a lot about plants. So also there was a medical school there. This became later this huge end part of the south of France perfume industry. This was really the place for perfumed gloves before grass. Um, and then later it kind of, you know, got overshadowed by, by grass as the center for perfume in the south of France. But it started there in Montpellier because they had all the plant experts who were really good at distilling things and creating stuff. Um, I already mentioned briefly about how... Um, it's because of the Islamic golden age with their advanced agriculture that they did all these really fancy kind of um, citriculture in Sicily and Italy. Nowadays, if you go to Sicily and Italy, I mean, everywhere in every shop, there's something with lemons on it. I mean, it's a huge motif because it's Islamic and that's something that they got um, when they were there. It's also very big in Iberian traditions, certainly in Spain and Portugal. Um, and 
important to us is distillation. So this very, very famous scientist who's part of this, Alkindi, is one of the first people to document, document um, distillation of rose water and alcohol distillations. A distillation of wine is where they um, take wine and distill it to create spirits of wine, which is essentially uh, grape alcohol. That's what we call grape alcohol. Uh, currently, a lot of um, people, natural perfumers actually still really love grape alcohol as the medium that they use. Um, and these people also started writing books where they gave perfume recipes, which is kind of interesting. Okay, so next. Okay, so eventually this is all going to pull together. Trust me, I hope. <laughs> and I'll, I'm almost to the 6:45. I, I give me five minutes, and I'll do break uh, questions. Does if anyone has questions, they can write in the chat, or I'll wait to the end. Um, hopefully, I'm not like being too confusing. So, okay, so we talked about citrus fruits, but the whole point of this is to talk about other lemon smelling things which are lined with citrus fruits and have similar qualities. So we're gonna start with Melissa. So um, Melissa, the word Melissa is from the Greek, um, a Greek word which means honey. Um, in French, I think people are familiar with yel, which means honey, um, it, it is a Greek root and uh, the reason why this particular lemon balm is named after honey is because it's very attractive to bees. It's an incredibly, it's an incredible history of use. It was definitely documented back 2000 years ago in various um, sorts of accounts of healing herbs, it was mentioned. Um, it spread throughout there through Spain and Europe. And, and there's some fascinating stuff about what did people bring with them to the United States? Like what did they think of as a cottage herb and lemon balm was very popular. So obviously it was important. Um, one of the nicknames of it is heart's delight, which is important. Um, as I said, when people give names to plants, it's usually because of some function for them. Um, it had this huge reputation as pretty much as the panacea. Like it was apparently good for pretty much everything. Um, of importance to us with perfumes and magical stuff is that there was a very, very famous 11th century um, uh, polymath and physician, physician Ibn Sina, who in, in anglicized name is Avicenna, who wrote all these treatises on medicine, which continued to be used for like, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. He wrote this whole treatise on cardiac drugs, which, basically talked about things that were good for your heart, but his sense of the heart was also sort of like your emotions and your feelings. Um, and he felt that certain types of fragrances were incredibly helpful for your heart and that they were almost like fix-its for people who had um, complex illnesses and like your vital spirits were thought to come from your heart because it was the center of your body. And this was like a hugely... Um, important one in his treatises, which were later read by people in the next slide, as we will see. Oh, okay, sorry, this is my bee thing. Sorry, I forgot about this. So remember I said that this attracts bees. So this is fascinating too. So I don't know if people know, bees make their own little perfume called the Nasenoff pheromone. So they have this little gland in the back and they produce this pheromone, which is mostly citral and geranial and has a lot of other trace ingredients. And they used it to mark the hive and, it, and it, it marks the hive so that people come back to it. And apparently they also mark their favorite flowers, like it's some sort of Yelp review, like this is the best flower, hey, come on by. Um, and of interest to us is that they make a knockoff pheromone. This one here says bee bait. My understanding is it's two parts, I'll talk about the chemicals in a minute, but it's two parts citral, one part geranial. Um, and the reason why people, the bees love the lemon balm is because it has a huge amount of citral in it and that's the thought of why it attracts them. So the ancient people who did beekeeping for like more than 10,000 years knew this and wrote about it and it's symbolically important because something that draws bees also draws affluence because honey was thought to be very lucky and a sign of like wealth and so on. So here's another kind of symbolic thing that says that this lemon scented herb draws like golden, good, rich things to you because it draws bees. Okay, so next, next slide here. Um, 
Oh, okay. This isn't very good. But um, so just to throw in a perfume here because I feel like I needed to. So um, lemon balm or Melissa is, you, is something that has been used as a fragrance note. The essential oil is incredibly expensive and it's notorious as being one of the most adulterated of all essential oils because when you do a steam distillation of, of uh, lemon balm, um, it, it basically, you use massive amounts of material and have just a couple drops of essential oil. It doesn't produce very much. It's a very difficult distillation. And um, so it's very expensive, but it has been used. And so according to, I think I gave you the Arctander reference. So according to Arctander, um, lemon balm was used in the top note of this, of this famous fragrance from the 40s. Um, and, you know, it had a lemon balm and lots of other citrus notes. And then otherwise it was sort of a floral aldehyde. But the name of it is really interesting. First of all, notice that it's a big round bottle and it's gold. I mean, it kind of looks like a lemon, right? So it's Eau de Coeur Joie, which means Eau of Heart Joy. And if you remember, when I was telling you what the name of it, this herb is, it's also called Heart's Ease. So it had this whole thing about joy and the heart. Obviously, someone probably had like read about some of the lore of lemon balm. This perfume, just as a side note, is one of my favorite perfumers. It's like one of the first women to make a name in perfumery is Charmaine Sellier. She made Fracas, which is this incredible, incredible, like white floral fragrance. And she made Von Vert. And she made this in the 1940s. Um, and um, just, it's interesting because it features lemon balm. So I had to throw that in there. But symbolically, the heart joy thing is important, as we'll see in the next slide. Ready? Ah, OK. So I mentioned this, I think, last time because um, I was talking about spices, but it is important. So um, cordials. If you look in the middle there, I use the word cordial. Um, cordials nowadays is used for just kind of like fancy herbal liqueurs. But in fact, these were originally medicines that were made mostly in monasteries. The, the word C-O-R means heart, um, and these were literally thought to be medicines for your heart. Um, and because of that, they chose various plants and herbs that were aligned with your heart, and they frequently actually colored the cordial gold. Sometimes they added like flakes of gold. Sometimes they added um, things like saffron, which would make it gold. This was an extremely famous one called um, Carmelite water. Eau de Carme that is, you know, these things all have this folklore that basically, I don't know how much I believe of it, but theoretically, the um, Carmelite order had this recipe, they started making it in the early 17th century, and then later, it, you know, it was made um, as a product that people sold, and the ingredients from the one list that I saw is that, um, it has lemon balm and lemon peel, so it has two lemons in it. Then it has a bunch of spices. It has nutmeg, coriander, cloves, cinnamon. It has angelica, um, and then it's in spirit of wine, which is a um, a grape alcohol. Um, now, if you look at the top, why this is important is because the monasteries were the inheritors of a lot of this um, incredible uh, advanced information about herbs and plants because they had these amazing libraries and they had people who could read they often had similar libraries to some of these early medical schools and um, they had this whole mission of treating the ill and so most monasteries would have an infirmary which is a place where you treat sick people they would almost always have an herb garden and this is why monasteries um, maintained a lot of fragrant plants from ancient Rome, you know, they carried on a lot of traditions by growing like lavender and roses and other fragrant things and, and saving them. Um, and they had still rooms. There's a lot of archaeological evidence that they, in fact, were doing some distillations really quite early in really small scale, you know, just tiny artisan distillations. But they would make these cordials um, and these would be used for healing. They were used for your heart. But like I said last time, the idea of the heart that it was also your emotions and that there was this idea if you treated people's heart like the whole rest of their body would kind of like also um, be benefited because the heart is in the center of your body it's kind of like the sun it really kind of benefits everything so 
Um, this really tells you this whole symbolic thing with citrus, that it does all these kinds of good things at once. Um, and as we flip to the next slide, I'll start talking about colognes and stuff, but, um, but do people have chat questions or do you want me to wait to the end? Uh, yeah, actually there's, um, if, if you don't mind, is now a good time to ask a quick question on behalf of someone? Or is it in the chat? Because I don't see it's a, it. It's to me, me privately. It's to me privately. Oh, no, that's fine. Yes, uh, read yeah. it out loud to me. Okay, uh, can James talk about how scent is a, a gateway to the soul and the spirit, sorry, glasses. Can James talk about how scent is a gateway to the soul and the spiritual quality of aroma? Lemon has a rough texture, bitter rind, yet beautiful aroma. Is that part of the Materia Magica story? Wow, that's a really good question. I'm not sure that I could do a sound bite for that. But um, yes, I do not mean to imply that the, I'm only talking about the fragrance, but the physical appearance of <clears throat> citrus is important, as I said, because it's round, that's very important. Um, because it is yellow, that's for, or gold, that's very important. <clears throat> The roughness of it, I'm not totally sure. That's interesting. Um, th there are some classifications, but I'm not sure about that. The whole thing of the sun is because of, it's complex, but there's this whole traditional medicine about medical astrology. The sun is placed in the center of your body and your heart, and it's thought to control lots of different things. Um, and so um, if people were melancholy or they're having health issues, a lot of times by dialing up the sun, by by using solar kinds of plants and stuff, they would be benefited by that. Um, I don't think that's an adequate answer, but I don't, it's a really good question, but it would be like an hour to answer it, I think. So maybe towards the end, I can answer it better, okay? Okay, thank you. All right. Anybody else um, before we move on or? Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll see. I hope I'm not incomprehensible. So, um, okay. So here we are in Florence. Um, this is Santa Maria de Vella. This is the pharmacy in Santa Maria de Vella, um, which if you're familiar with it, you know, they have stores like in Beverly Hills or somewhere in West LA, I forget where it is, and elsewhere where you can buy these like incredible soaps and colognes and they have this famous potpourri, which is like insane. It's really expensive, but it's really great. I was really fortunate to go on this tour with a bunch of perfume people with Sniffapalooza where we spent like this huge amount of time and they took us to their museum and took us through all these things. But it's interesting because um, it's quite intact. It was a monastery apothecary in the 13th century. So the monks were making medicines for people and at a certain point things became a bit more secular in the 17th century and they started selling their things. Um, which were medicines, but also cosmetics and fragrances. And they made um, special bespoke things for the royalty. Um, part of this is lore and it's kind of hard to know how real it is, but apparently they did actually make a fragrance for Catherine um, de Medici, which they called Eau de la Reine. Um, and she's quite famous because uh, she was very young when she was sent off to France. Um, she has this really incredible, crazy story where, you know, her parents were murdered, all these horrible things happened. She was married off um, to Henri. She went to France and she was very unhappy, but she, she brought all these fragrances to Paris and she brought her own perfumer. His name was Rene and she brought fragrant gloves and all these things. And she's thought to have really kind of kickstarted the whole fragrant glove industry and the perfume industry because she had her own private perfumer, sort of an interesting thing. Um, but this is an example of what, you know, one of these sort of uh, monastery apothecaries would be like. Um, and um, it keys us into the next slide, which is that cordials and things eventually became colognes. Um, so this is as, as recently as like the 18th century. Sadly, you can't read this, but down towards the bottom, it has this whole little thing from the Royal Society of Medicine. It's basically like a a medical like review like yes this is like a panacea it's good for everything it cures all illnesses um and remember that these were made of grape alcohol so sometimes people did have little sips of it or they put it on sugar cubes but they most often splashed it on their neck and so on and it was thought to have some sort of healing ability and also kind of to refresh you and as you see it has like all these sort of like magical symbols associated with it um and mythological kind of motifs, but it was still considered medical like as recently as a couple hundred years ago. Okay, next. 
Okay. So all this stuff that I've been gabbing about kind of leads us into how things that are lemony became almost like miracle waters that were used for all kinds of things as far as healing. So I showed you the little teeny tiny bottle of 4711. Um, and um, I don't really want to go off in too much of a tangent because I did a, a clone class before, but just basically what happened is that eventually these early things like Carmelite water started being transformed into early clones. Um, and then someone from France, the Farina family um, went up to Germany and that's how we started with one of the first commercial cl clones, which is 4711. The story which makes sense is that well, they claim they got a recipe from a monk, which could be possible because monasteries had recipes and was basically a citrus cologne. And the reason it was in Germany is because Germany could uh, level up and do larger scale distillations because they were more technologically advanced. So instead of having a tiny distillation, they could do like a mega, you know, big, huge distillations and actually produce lots of bottles of 4711, which became very famous. Um, first it was called Aqua Mirabilis and then it became 4711. So this is still produced. I, obviously it's not the original formula, but it's really beautiful. It's a lovely cologne. And what's fascinating is that <clears throat> it is used as a spiritual cologne. It, um, it's kind of expensive and it's a little bit more expensive about floral wa than Florida water, which I'll mention in a minute. Um, but it is used by spiritual mediums. It seems to be very popular <clears throat> in Puerto Rico. It's also, I believe, used by some Cuban people who practice a type of spiritual tradition <clears throat> that is um, called espiritismo. Um, again, it's daunting to explain this in like 15 seconds, but if you recall from watching old movies, Probably people are familiar with people sitting around doing seances and stuff like that in the 19th century. There was a particular offshoot that in France called Spiritism, which um, became extremely popular in places like Mexico, Puerto Rico, Cuba, and Brazil, um, starting in the late 19th century, and it's still extremely popular. And they have spiritual meetings where people will go in to um, a hall, there'll frequently be like a table covered with a white tablecloth, like an altar, a misa, and they'll have bottles there, they'll have um, you know, big glasses of water, they'll have pictures of saints and other kind of spirits there. And they will use the cologne in various ways. One way is that um, they will refresh themselves with it, like they'll splash it on their neck and so on during the spiritual sessions because they feel like it helps them be in tune with various spirits. They also splash it all over the floor. I've been in places where splash is like an understatement. I mean, they just pour out like gallons of it onto the floor pretty much. Um, they do another thing where they'll have a basin of water. And in the basin of water, they'll put a, a spiritual cologne like 4711 or Florida water. And um, they will add other things to it. They will frequently add um, flower petals. They often will add some fresh herbs, like for instance, basil is popular. They could tear up some basil or some sage. They'll put it in this big basin and people will walk up there and they'll use it to refresh themselves. They'll put it on their hands and on their neck. Um, people who are doing spiritual readings or consultas, like consultations between clients, they'll often clean themselves off because it just sort of get rid of the vibe of the person that they're seeing. Um, and so it's very popular. Um, it's, it's, as I said, it's used in cleansing. <clears throat> they will use it in spiritual baths where, uh, frequently you will have like a consultation with someone and they will say, okay, well, you're in this horrible relationship. Your husband left you. These are the things you can do. I'm going to prescribe this bath for you along with other things. And the bath may include pouring some 4711 into the bath along with maybe some herbs maybe some rose water um, and bathing in it for several days as part of a, a ritual thing to kind of cleanse you. Um, other ones that are popular, Florida water is by far the most popular one, mostly because it's everywhere and it's relatively inexpensive. Um, now, is Tim gonna did, is Tim gonna redo his Florida water class? Is that a yes, hopefully in the future? Um, um, we'll see, yeah, hopefully. So, I hope Tim does this. He was going to do a whole, whole Florida water class where he teaches people how to make Florida water. 
The deal with Florida water is that it's mostly, it's citrus, there's some lavender, clove, cinnamon, you know, a few other things in it. Um, it's extremely popular and um, mostly because it's easy to get. Um, you know, you can pretty much, if you're in Miami, you can like walk into the Walmart and get it. I mean, it's like that easy to get. The Hoyt Scalone is very Southern. I may mention it a little bit later. Um, these all have very similar uses. They're used for protection, for luck, for healing. I'll try to give a few more examples um, as we move on. But just hopefully all these threads pull together where like lemon seems to have this miraculous ability to do all this kind of cleansing. It wards off the evil eye. You know, it makes you more joyful. And um, it sort of jumped the gun and become like a spiritual product in a lot of traditions. Okay, so next slide is for cleansing. So, oh, there we go. So, um, floor washes are kind of a big deal in some of these traditions. Now, I, I have a hard time kind of condensing this, but there are a very large number of African traditional religious practices or African diasporic practices. These are practices that generally come from slaves who have gone to the new world. And the, most, the one that most people are aware of is Santeria or Lakumi which comes from Cuba, now is mostly practiced in all over the United States, um, certainly Miami, like a ton of people. Also from Cuba, there's Palo Mayambe, and like, you know, in Haiti and other places, there's Badu. Also, there's Badu like in New Orleans and other islands like Jamaica, there's Obea, there's all these other things. But they often have this tradition of cleansing the floor. And so lemon is a thing they will frequently use. I like to tell people, especially people from California. I think people are familiar with feng shui from California. Like everyone's like, oh, I decluttered my house and I put this thing in a corner and all that. People have this idea that making an alteration in your house will fix your luck. Well, this is a variation of that. Cleaning your house will clean out some of the bad luck for you and your family. And so washing the floor is technically a ritual thing that people will do. Lemon is very popular. Ammonia is considered a very hardcore cleaning if you really want to clean stuff out. And so there are spiritual workers who buy lemon scented ammonia and to slosh it out in the, you know, mop water and use it as a hardcore cleansing, like probably 10 times as much as like it's a 10 times super powered above sage kind of cleansing. If people just really want to cleanse it out, they would do something like this. The mop water will frequently have other things like sea salt or kosher salt along with herbs and things. It can be very complicated. Um, okay, next. Oh, this is for Saskia because it's from Cuba, all right? So I don't know if you're familiar with this. Um, this is a family company from Cuba that post Castro moved to Miami, Cruzeles. I hope I'm saying it right. Um, <clears throat> who are known for making these colognes. <clears throat> the one that a lot of people relate to is they make this violet scented cologne that they use on babies. So everyone is like, oh my God, I remember that from when I was a little kid. It's this powdery violet thing, you know. Um, but they make a lot of different colognes um, that seem to have been largely taken up by like Santeria and other spiritual practice people who use them all the time in their rituals. Literally, I got this picture off of a Walmart website because you can buy 32 ounce bottles of stuff like this because as I said, it's not an exaggeration. I've been in ritual situations where they pour buckets of like rum and colonia and all this stuff all over the floor as a cleansing. They use it a lot um, and they use it in baths and things too. This particular one is kind of like citrus floral, etc., etc. I just use it as an example. But it's fascinating because it is a, um, a Cuban family company that is now in Florida in Miami, which is a center for a lot of these spiritual practices. Okay, next. <laughs> All right, so here's another lemon herb. Okay, so... I, not all the lemon herbs are exactly alike, but they kind of are in the family, so they have very similar kinds of um, things that they're good for. So um, <clears throat> this is lemon verbena. I will do like a super fast disambiguation here. So there is a there is a herb called vervain 
that is something that was used in antiquity. It is in the verbena family, but it's a, it's a verbena officinalis. It is an herb that has no smell. So anything that says vervain on it or verbena is gonna be this lemon verbena because this is the one that has the really strong smell. Um, there's a lot of myths about the whole vervain family. It's mentioned in antiquity. There's all these stories about like the wounds of Christ were like staunch with vervain and it's like, you know, like all this over the top kind of stuff. Um, this particular plant, this type of vervain, was only really kind of discovered in, in the Western world in the 18th century when it was found growing in Peru. Um, and it immediately, it's very interesting, it's one of these colonial kind of plants like patchouli where it like quickly gets adopted as a perfume um, and it became very fashionable by the early 19th century as a fragrance. Um, it, um, in, as I'll talk about in a minute, um, there are other sort of disambiguations is that they use the word vervain sometimes for lemongrass. An old term for lemongrass in French was um, vervain des Andes, which means like Andean lemongrass because the smell is very similar. And I'll talk to you about that in a, in a second. Um, this little quote, which is hard to read, is from one of the Gone to the Wind books. Um, and it's, it's talking about Scarlett's mother, who I believe was French, and it says, um, let's see. Lemon verbena surrounded her floating gently from Eleanor Butler's silk gown and silken hair. It was a fragrance that had always been part of Ellen O'Hara, the scent for Scarlett of comfort, of safety, of love, of life before the war. So this was like a super chic fragrance. She associates with her French mother. It's very important because it puts it into the American South. Verbena cologne was really big in the United States and in Europe and England in the 19th century. Um, 19th century, uh, there was a lot of single note colognes. They were often, you know, like violet or white rose or whatever. Verbena was like huge. Um, and it became adopted as a magical thing, as we'll see in the next couple slides. Boop. Next slide. All right. So here we see um, um, Esprit de Verveine. And this is by whatever this company is, Gerard Feast. I don't know what they are, but it looks really fancy. So there are all kinds of companies made their own um, Verven, which would be a lemon verbena. Um, so the name of it is Lip it's Lipia citridora. It, it, there's all these other Latin binomials, like just ignore them, but this is what they used for now mostly. But there are also several other um, plants in this family that are very lemon scented, which have similar uses. This is the only one really that finds its way into fragrance. Um, just a sort of quickie thing on this. You can get a lemon verbena essential oil and there's also sometimes an absolute. It's quite expensive. My understanding is that it's super restricted when Ifra, so probably if you see something that says verbena, it's probably not gonna be verbena and I'll talk to you a minute why it's gonna be lemongrass, but um, Lemon verbena and the other lipias have all these magical things. There is a Brazilian one called Lipia alba, which is used for in, um, in love drawing um, magic. Um, there's all these things where you combine it with like dirt from a brothel and all these things to draw people towards you. Um, it, but it's, it's something that's available in Brazil, but not really in fragrances as far as I know. You can get Lipia javanica as an essential oil. It's very big in South a Africa. It's, it's a lemon scented plant that's popular, people grow it. Um, and it, it's been used um, perhaps for thousands of years in a lot of different um, tribes there, use it for like fevers, it wards off insects, it protects people, it's for good luck. Um, and then there's another Lipia in Mexico called Az Lipia dulcis, which is this Aztec sweet herb, which also has this reputation as like attracts things too. So, these all are, are similar plants and they all seem to have these similar uses of attraction and love and that kind of thing. Um, so in the next slide, boop. Okay, so sorry this is blurry. Um, are lemon leaves used for anything? Oh, that's a good question. I'll, I'll, um, I'll answer at the end. Um, so this slide shows some of the places where you will find this African um, lipia. The reason why this is important is because I'll be talking about some practices in New Orleans. There, it, there are some theories that are probably um, reasonable um, involving how 
Out of the millions of slaves that came to the new world, there were many slaves that were experts at plants and there were healers and spiritual leaders. They basically were really expert at identifying plants. When they came to someplace like Louisiana and they didn't have African herbs, of course, they would look for substitutes. What happened is if they didn't have a sacred tree, like an African teak, they would pick a tree that was growing where they were. And it's reasonable to think if they had lemon scented herbs that they used for magic in Africa, when they came to the United States, that they might pick one of these lemon scented things as a magical product. It's hard to actually say this is exactly what happened, but it is a reasonable um, conclusion. So we'll talk about this in the next slide. Um, next. Okay. Here we are in the New Orleans Pharmacy Museum. So this is par part of something I started doing in 2001. So it was like 19 years ago when I was in New Orleans. There's this incredible pharmacy museum. It's really worth going to. Um, yeah, I love that museum. It's really cool. So it's this museum because there was a pharmacy there like forever. And pharmacies not only had drugs, but they had a lot of fragrances and people would go there and they would get kind of like knockoff colognes and stuff where they would go there for verbena and you know, they would get verbena from the pharmacy and not surprisingly it was in New Orleans so people would go for a lot of New Orleans voodoo type stuff too um, pretty much just everyone went to the pharmacy to get stuff as we'll see in the next slide um, I found that there was a formulary there in the New Orleans Pharmacy Museum a formulary is a book of formulas um, you know they would have things that they would do for medicines in this case this is for perfumes I've I think you can read this, this is from my phone. Essence of Verbena is basically lemongrass and alcohol. So um, I will remind you that the old name for lemongrass is um, Vervain des Indes, which, which basically means um, Indian Verbena. And um, my theory, I'm not a linguist, but this is pretty much what I think based on some of the formulas I'll show you, is that, <clears throat> um, French, so New Orleans French is slightly different, but basically Vervain becomes Van Van when you creolize it because Creole actually sort of like simplifies stuff. So Vervain became this perfume name Van Van, which we'll see in the next slide. Um, so Essence of Verbena, well, we'll talk, I'll talk a, a little aside of the lemongrass. So the lemongrass um, is very interesting. So this is another lemony herb. I would say probably in the world, in fragrance, um, you know, quite a bit of lemongrass is used. It's a Simbapogon, and there's probably more than a hundred different Simbapogons. Um, there are grasses. The ones that we're familiar with that are lemony are lemongrass and citronella. Lemongrass is the one that's used in fine fragrance. Citronella tends to be more functional. And also we know that it's used as a bug spray or in various candles and stuff because it repels insects, um, which will be important. I'll we'll talk about that. Um, but then another, another Simbapogon that's very heavily used is Palmarosa. Now Palmarosa has something called geraniol, which smells super rosy. So, um, you know, this particular um, uh, Simbapogons can go in several different directions. There's all different types of like sub classifications. Um, but um, they are important because they're really ancient. There's a lot of um, both evidence in sort of textual evidence and formulas and also sort of tombs that there were Simbapogons in ancient Egypt, that they used them in fragrances and in incense. <clears throat> My understanding from them looking at them is that they can't really tell um, what kind of Simbapogon, so they can't really say did it smell like lemons or roses, but they did use them in fragrances and um, they are still used in Africa. That's, there's a, um, a type of a, a, a Sudanese Simbapogon called Mahareb um, that's used to, to ward off the evil eye. They use it in incense, so I mean it still is used in Africa. Um, and lemongrass mostly consists of citral. That's the main uh, thing that you find in it. Okay, so next slide. Okay, I won't do too much science, but here's the scent function thing. So citral is a aroma uh, compound. It's actually two molecule, right and left-handed molecules that occur together, not to be boring, but it is found in a lot of things. It's, it's, when we talk about natural isolates, it's like a chemicals that we isolate from various things, in this case, lemongrass that has this wonderful lemony smell. 
but lots of things have citrol, like the verbena has it, most citrus has citrol, lemon myrtle is something that's in, intensely citrol, super lemony, lemon eucalyptus, lemon basil, all the lemon geraniums, they're actually pelargoniums, if you grow those, they grow them a lot in California, these all have citrol, and they all have similar uses as far as being lucky. So, next. Oh, I also wrote against pests, so I'll just throw that out. Um, these are used for insects. Now, here's function is reflected in spiritual things. So, what do we call annoying people who bother us all the time? We call them pests. And so, if you have people who are buzzing around you and always bothering you and draining you, um, you could use lemongrass in a spell to like ward them off. And in fact, it's thought to protect you from annoying people. In case you want to do that, you can start using that right now. <laughs> um, but that's another interesting thing. So, so back to New Orleans. Um, I will show you a picture of the book in a minute. Um, Zora Neale Hurston was this incredible Harlem Renaissance writer. She's really brilliant. She studied um, anthropology and she got funded to do this incredible, what was called a folklore study in the late 1920s in the South. And she went to New Orleans and other places. And she um, was taught by a number of people who taught her that if you use this thing called Van Van, that it was incredibly useful. Uh, it was like a multi-tool. You could use it for luck. You could use it for gambling. You could use it for cleansing you. And the neighborhood of um, Algiers is in New Orleans. It had this reputation as being the hotbed for this type of spiritual practice called hoodoo or conjure or root work. And apparently there's all these stories that you couldn't walk down the street. The whole place smelled like Van Van all the time. It was like just like a lemon, lemony smell was like on all the sidewalks because it was so popular. Um, this is the article from 1931 called Hoodoo in America. And the next slide is a book that came out later in the 1930s. This was kind of a book version of some of her research. Um, it also, and Frank Boas was her mentor, super famous um, uh, Frank Boas in anthropology. And this talked about a lot of the folklore she got there. Um, and she gave some formulas. So in the next um, page, the next one, we will see. Okay, this is from the book, Essence of Van Van, 10% oil of lemongrass and alcohol. So it's exactly what I said, Van Van is basically lemongrass and alcohol. Um, and different doctors, those are root doctors, um, use it for luck power of all kinds. It is the most popular conjure drug in Louisiana. So this was the thing that you just used for everything. If you look at the top, there's also this fast luck version where she uses, you use oil of an aqueous solution of oil of citronella, where you scrub the floors um, and you pull customers into a store. Like a lot of times they would do the sidewalk and pull it in so that people would come into the store. Um, okay, so next. Sorry, this is grainy, but here's like a little ad. Artist conception of person using Van Van oil. So these ads are really great. They had to avoid saying that they were magical because it would be mail order fraud. So they would often say, these, so this says, Conjure men, spiritualists, and voodoos. It is said, have great faith in the so-called Van Van oil. Many thousands of folks believe in the teachings of alleged savants, capitalized. They believe that the sprinkling of certain kinds of oil around their home or anointing their body with the oil would produce luck or drive away evil. They also put it on the doorstep. Yeah, that's a thing. They would put it on like your doorstep or on your house or so on. So these things were sold. Look, it has a little clover. It's very lucky. Um, and they're pouring it on a stone. Like a lot of times people would put, uh, put it on lucky objects that they would use for gambling. Okay, next. Okay, so how are we doing for time? Okay, we're almost out of time. So I'm just going to finish with this slide. So I apologize that I did not get to go into other kinds of things. Lemons appear like all over the place. I'm just going to end. So there's shamans in Peru who use, use lemon and limes to do cleansings. Um, here we see, so curanderismo is a tradition in Mexico and the Southwest to a certain extent, also in um, you know South America and so on. And they do traditional healings. One of them, they do it by sweeping you with stuff. They will sweep you with a lemon. They can sweep you with an egg. Here, the guy on the left hand has um, pink pepper tree. I think we're familiar of uh, uh, California pepper tree from California, but it's also pink pepper that we use in fine fragrance. Um, and sometimes rosemary too. So they'll often do them sequentially. 
But, um, and then you see they use incense too. They do all kinds of things. He's wearing a ritual clothing, the white and red. Um, and they will, they often go from head down, they'll sweep you with the lemon and go down and then they'll throw away the lemon. So it's another example of, of just another culture that finds lemons to be useful for stuff like that. Um, wow, I kind of timed this really close. So um, I feel like I should open it to some questions. Are lemon leaves used for anything? Um, yes, they are. Um, not as much as the actual rinds and the fragrance. I totally didn't get into lemon juice. So lemons can be used for cursing people. That's mostly the juice because it's sour, because things like vinegar and lemon juice sometimes are used for doing bad stuff. But I was really focusing on the um, happy, happy stuff. So, um, oh, I love that museum. So yeah, the Pharmacy Museum in New Orleans is really fascinating. It has a lot of stuff about the history of perfume. Um, it's interesting. Um, Audrey, other than citral and delimonene, are there other significant molecules that make up the scent of lemon? Yes. So go to our, I, I gave you the link for Arctander, right? So I'll oh, hold it up. Yes. I have an actual physical book like you do because I used it a lot, but through the miracle of PDFs, there is a legal version of it on, I believe, arc, is it archive.org? I don't remember, but it, we sent you the link. There is a completely legal digital proxy of it. It is a classic work. Um, it's amazing. He tells you all kinds of things that are in it. Um, citral, delimiting, there are like so many things in lemons. Now, if you watch the video, it's fascinating. The top notes of lemon um, have pinene in them, like I think either alpha or beta pinene. So when you first scrape the lemon, you get this almost piney kind of scent if you really concentrate. It's very, very, you have to scrape it fresh and you'll get it for a second. Um, it's, yeah, scrape it like that and you'll get a little whiff of pinene for like, I swear to God, 60 seconds. And um, it's very transient, but it adds to this really like fresh kind of like uh, impression of it, but you wouldn't normally pick it up. Um, yes, there's lots of other things in it. There are a lot of terpenes um, that are responsible for the fragrances. And to be honest, different lemons have different things. Like for instance, um, you know, frequently in California, um, you know, we have a lot of different varieties we can use, um, Meyer lemons and stuff like that, which are, are um, you know, more floral and kind of softer. Um, and then, you know, then the traditional lemons and stuff. Did, did you guys want to, do people have questions? Do you want to unmute someone or anything? Is that uh, Yeah, if, if anybody has questions? any questions, now is a great time. And James, shall we put your camera back on? Or are you just so you... Oh, yes. Let me, like, <laughs> up slouching. <laughs> Thanks. Hold on. Again, uh, slouch. Are you ready? There we go. All yeah. right. Okay, I'm going to ask you to start the video. See, anybody have any questions? Now yeah. is a good time. Or you can just hold up your lemon okay. and smile. Like I, I, the front is beautiful. The back is picked apart now. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, I, well, my I, head's I, not moving. I, I just have a left frozen frame. Oh. Okay, I think there's a question from Nuri. So I'm gonna actually, if you're not asking a question, please make sure to mute yourself. And Nuri, I, can, I think I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, totally. Okay. Um, I just wanted to bring up um, a point about the connection between bees and honey and lemons. Uh, are, are you familiar with the uh, folk tradition of telling the bees? Is that something right, you've heard the whole in the past? thing when people die, yes, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah there was this belief that if you're a beekeeper and you die, you have to let people know, and there's these stories where the bees would go to the graveside and the family would see them all swarm around. Yeah, it's really interesting. It, it, I wouldn't be surprised that the bees could actually smell the fragrance of a specific person or they were able to know that there was that person or maybe that person, who knows. But it's yeah. fascinating. But the bee honey thing with lemon um, balm, of course, is, is ancient and it, it's, yeah. you know, a bee attractant. Yeah. I, I just wanted to, to add that there was a, a folk belief in England that, um, you know, you had to keep the bees there because they would leave with their leave. dead with their oh, right. relatives. So um, you had to entice them to stay so they would drape 
um, the apiaries with, uh, this is in the Victorian times, with like um, bunting, they would have a funeral for the bees and um, honey and lemon uh, flavored cookies and beer were given as offerings to the bees up until like the 1860s. Uh, and I just, I thought that was very interesting that they specifically made honey and lemon flavored food that have, obviously the bees were not eating, but it was ritualized as, as something, um, even into industrialized England. So I thought that was very interesting. I just and now we give them pesticides. Yeah. <laughs> Sadly, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's very cool. Someone should do a whole, you know, we use both beeswax absolute and honey and fragrances. Um, they're both really amazing and kind of fascinating. It would be cool to kind of talk about those and fragrances sometimes. So I don't know that much. I love them both. And by the way, this is kind of a warning um, because I've done it. If you do wear a lot of citral and geraniol, I swear to God, you may be exert some care because bees and stuff will like fly into your house. I've actually, I've actually had a thing where I was burning a bunch of beeswax candles and it like attracted them. So they, they really do come, not that there's a lot of bees around, but they do like it. So um, let's see, C and G, I don't know who you are. I would love to be as disciplined. Oh my God, I'm not that disciplined. <laughs> Put together as much. Um, that's very nice. I am kind of a freaky, obsessive person. I, I, I mentioned this before when I was in medical school, I did a whole thesis on olfaction and I had the ability to spend a lot of time on it. And I had a medical historian that kind of helped me at the biomedical library at UCLA, which is a absolutely staggeringly huge library. Um, and so, and I've had some really amazing people who've taught me as well. So thank you. That's nice. I sometimes think my stuff is obscure and incomprehensible. So hopefully it wasn't. If you have other questions, let me know. You may have found your people. 